This is the CCW Digital Speaker Spotlight Series. As always, I'm Brian Cantor, Principal Analyst for CCW Digital and your host for today's discussion. To run a contact center, you really need a great eye for design and strategy. You need to be able to set the right objectives, and then you really have to be able to develop efficient, realistic, pragmatic means of achieving that. But it also helps to have a real-world, first-hand view of the contact center experience. There really isn't any substitute for interacting with angry customers, dealing with complicated contact center tools, and answering to complex metrics. Wherever you go in the organization, whether you stay in the contact center, whether you move into marketing or any sort of customer facing function, you really need to know what it's like to interact with customers. What goes into that? Because if you don't understand that, you can't create the right organization. You can't create the right culture. And so all this is why we stress internal development within the contact center. It's why we'll be offering the latest installment of CCW University at our Nashville event this January. And it's also why we're inviting Corey Creek of Beachbody to lead one of our sessions. He's gone through the ranks within the contact center. He's seen the different challenges and opportunities. And so we're thrilled to have him and the insights we know he's going to be able to deliver. So before we get started, you know, we, Corey, how is everything? It's going great. Thank you. I'm looking forward to spending some time talking about um, what it takes to build that strategy based on a foundation of understanding the customer experience and what it's like to engage customers to create a successful business that meets their needs. That's exactly what we're going for with the university model and really with any of the sessions that's going to be happening at CCW Nashville this January. It's all about the idea of we can speak till we're blue in the face about the broad stroke stuff like, oh, be nice to the customers and they'll be nice to you. But if you don't know what it takes to actually make nice happen, if you haven't been there, if you haven't dealt with the bad side of the contact center or just the challenging side of the contact center, it's going to be very hard to communicate that message. It's going to be very hard to develop people who are capable of really connecting with customers. We know you've been there and we're thrilled to have the insights you're sure to share. And so kind of starting off today's conversation, so I, I've kind of teased it already, but you really, your foray into customer engagement was at the ground floor of the contact center, and you really worked your way up through the ranks. You took on different responsibilities and different roles. And so I'm wondering if you can share just what your journey entailed and when maybe it clicked that, okay, this is the career path for you. Oh, absolutely. So as I started in the contact center, I started as a, a, a fresh team manager uh, coming off a great experience uh, managing a full service restaurant. So full service restaurant, you are with the customer and you have that experience of being right there um, face to face with customers, meeting their needs. And as I started in the contact center, I was thrilled to get a team and be able to help people uh, take care of the customers on the phone. And my first job opportunity in the contact center turned into an escalation supervisor as company plans changed two weeks after I started. So I thought I was going to be leading a team and helping others on the phone. And what I discovered two weeks in is I'm going to have the privilege of talking with customers. I'll tell you, when that started, I wasn't sure it was a privilege. But as time went on, I realized that my experience as an escalation supervisor, talking to those customers that couldn't otherwise get support from agents on the, on the ground level for whatever reason, shaped the way I support contact center agents um, over the next 20 years. So as I started taking those escalated calls, with angry and upset customers, what I learned is there was always a path to find a way to meet their needs and match what I could do for the business with the best possible option for the customer. And that has shaped everything that I do, whether it's building training plans that support the development of agents or developing the strategy of how we'll engage self-service balance versus face-to-face -face contact uh, and online chat. As the industry has evolved, we've had to change our approach, and it always comes back to how do we match the business needs with the best available options for our customers. Now, I want to dive deeper into that escalations experience because that's something that you've identified as one of your strengths and also, I think, one of the valuable pieces of experience that you received. But let's face it, that can be a challenging task for a lot of 
customer facing employees. It also, just the idea of dealing with difficult or challenging or angry customers can be a source of discouragement for some agents. And thus, obviously, it becomes a challenge for the overall business. So I'm wondering if you have some tips about handling that aspect of the customer contact process and what it really takes to make these potentially unpleasant or challenging calls more enjoyable and productive. Yeah, Brian, you're right. It's hard. And and that's the, the first thing that is missed is escalated calls are hard. All calls are challenging, but when the business strategy, the business plans, for whatever reason, the processes don't meet the customer's need, and that call escalates. Uh, it's not always about the agent who was taking the call, and that's the first tip I would say is, as an agent, if you've got a situation where it is escalating, view that as an opportunity to learn how you might have better helped that customer. And, and then, as a second course, be prepared to acknowledge it might not have been about you. A lot of agents that I've worked with over the years tend to start with, it's not about me, it was the circumstance and it was out of my control, when in fact there was an opportunity for the agent to do a better job. And so helping agents discover from those escalated calls the opportunities to turn it around is the first step in improving that process, looking at it as a learning opportunity and not a missed opportunity. So that's the first thing. The second thing that I've talked with agents and call center leaders with later uh, in my career is the experience for the agent on the phone or in the center. When you're chatting with customers, you're generally chatting with one to three percent of your customer base. If you think about contacts overall, you're not talking with many of your customers because the reality is most customers received the service that they wanted and they're happy and they're going on their way and they're not in need of reaching out to the contact center. So just by data, uh, by statistics, we're talking with a small portion of the customer base and a disproportionate number of those are unhappy, which is why they're calling. And so helping agents and the leadership team keep their eye on the reality that our view is of a disproportionate unhappy audience and so pointing to success stories and acknowledging satisfied customers within the contact center helps give employees and agents perspective on the overall experience of our business it's not as bad as it appears if you just look at your call log for the day so that's that's the second thing that i talk about uh, and and then the third thing that i always want to keep in perspective is what are we doing as a business? And as am I, as an agent, whether I'm on the phone or a, a manager leading a team, are, are we connected to the mission of the organization? And are we bringing that mission to the contact? So at Beachbody, we are committed to helping people achieve their goals and enjoy a healthy, fulfilling life. In order for us to connect our employees and our agents around the world to that mission, we have to deliver on that commitment to our employees and ensure that we're providing the development that they need so that they can achieve their goals, which makes it a lot easier for them to talk about how our company is helping our customers meet their goals so that they can live a healthy, fulfilling life. Now, it's very clear just from the way you answer some of these questions and just from your overall approach to the contact center that you have a knack for this process. You really, it, you're passionate about it. You understand, I think, what it takes to succeed. And surely that played a big role in your overall evolution. Now, but by the same token, you obviously had help along the way, and that might have been you know, just being in, in the right culture, the right environment, maybe you had good tools, maybe you had employers and managers. So what do you look to as how some of these resources really helped you become a better customer contact professional? Yeah, from, as I think back, uh, that, that first job and uh, my second job in the call center, when I um, began to lead a team for the first time, within a couple of months, my manager at the time um, was moving on, and he suggested that I apply for his job. I said, I'm not ready for your job. He said, okay, then interview for the job and learn from it. And you'll hear this theme in everything that I talk about. Whether you win or whether you lose, take that as your learning opportunity and consider it a win. So he taught me many years ago, well, apply if, if you want the role, apply for the role, and then use that 
when you don't get it, as an opportunity to learn from that experience and build up the skill sets that you need. Build your development plan so that the things you're learning are equipping you. And lo and behold, I actually was hired into that position that I applied for completely unequipped. Now, fast forward another 10 years in my career, and I wanted to make a move out of the contact center into sales, something that doesn't happen very often because the roles are so different. So again, I approached a senior leader in the sales organization and said, hey, I want to make a move from here to here, and I know I don't have that skill set. What can I do to move in that direction? And we spent about 15 minutes talking about what it would take to make that move. And I walked away knowing that that was going to take years, not days or even weeks. And I came back with a development plan. This year, these are the 10 things I'm going to do. Roughly one thing a month to start to build that skill. And about 18 months later, I was promoted into a division sales manager role. Not because they wanted me in that role, but because I did the hard work to develop my skills, I leveraged people and processes within the organization to prepare myself for the next role. I use that in the career conversations that I do with employees on a regular basis at Beachbody now. I spend time with employees uh, twice a month, just focused on their careers, providing them guidance, having similar conversations to those that leaders took time to have with me years ago so that others can advance their career in a similar way. Now, obviously, you clearly understand the importance of employee engagement well. I think you've benefited from some great advice, and you understand the role culture plays. And so speaking of, about Beachbody for a second, what are some, are some things that you put into place to really create a more engaging, more customer-centric culture? You know, it, it, it changes over time. Some of the things that we're using right now, because the, the industry has changed a lot. As, as leaders, we use a platform, uh, Office Vibe, which there's a lot of different tools out there. But we use an engagement platform that gives employees an anonymous voice. Of course, employees can go to Glassdoor and tell the whole world what they think. We prefer to have this anonymous tool that keeps us connected with employees. And one of the things we like about it is an employee can give us feedback, and then we can respond to them while they remain anonymous. And that gives us the opportunity to have a dialogue where they feel safe and will say things that are a little bit uncomfortable. So it helps us know what employees are thinking. So first, we have to have a mindset and, and watch the aggregate data over time when we uh, put all of the employee experience feedback together. Where, are, are we getting better? Are we getting worse? What's working and what's not? And we can see those trends. So at a strategic level, we use that data uh, at a at a lower at, at a individual level we're engaging with individuals in conversations about their feedback that's that's a tool that we use um, another important thing is activities just getting people together for something fun that's not about work is really important. And, and it's often the thing we miss, especially in contact centers, where we've got really tight margins and incredibly sharp timelines. And we need to have people on the phone or on chat to stay connected with our customers and maintain our service levels. So we have to do our due diligence with workforce to protect time for employees to just have some fun. And it really doesn't have to be particularly structured. It's, in fact, the unstructured stuff that often helps. And so we use committees. We have a, a committee of employees that help shape these monthly activities that employees get to do. And we partner with our workforce team to make sure that it's staggered in a way that different employees get to connect with different people over time and we protect our service level along the way as well. So that's important. Next is celebrating small wins. Big wins matter, and we do the quarterly incentives and the big programs to really recognize masterful achievement. But I'll, I'll say one thing about leadership and recognition. It's the small things that matter, and those things add up more than anything else. So helping our leaders know that pats on the back on a regular basis about meaningful behaviors that they want to reinforce are critical to performance improvement 
and employee engagement. So we help our leaders learn those skills to have regular, short, encouraging conversations that highlight specific behaviors and not that general, hey, you're doing a great job, which is not meaningful and often has a counter, a counter impact. In addition to that, doing little recognitions and little rewards. It's actually something that I learned on the sales side that I bought, brought back to the contact center, which is having challenges that people can compete in short term, whether it's um, doing something for the day or doing something for the week. And that happens to coincide with what we're seeing in our quality results indicate we need to improve a job performance. So we're recognizing the behaviors that we wanna see repeated and doing it in small ways with little recognition that's loud and seen by others, but not costing a lot of money. It's just taking time to tell people that they're great. It's really important, and if you want to do one thing well in a contact center to keep employee engagement high, recognize small things often. So that certainly really addresses the balance between culture and performance. I noticed that you obviously talked about the work-life balance. You talked about making employees happy and making them enjoy the environment, but you tied it to behaviors and things that really impact the health and success of the organization. Now, how do you sort of, you know, you talked about, again, good behaviors. How do you sort of define and then scale those? So how do you sort of rally support behind maybe the key metrics that really matter to your particular experience? It's, it's really about connecting employees to the process. They know what works, and so they know who the peer leaders are. So again, we bring those peer leaders together, not the people that we gave position power to, but the people that we know have permission power within the organization. That's oftentimes agents with tenure or agents that just they're the ones that people ask for help. So we bring them in and get their insights on how can we effectively create a better experience for our customers. And so engaging employees in the decision-making process, whether it's in the contact center or in our product development group, it's really drawing on the ideas of the people in the organization and how we can improve the experience. Obviously, we've got basic CSAT and fundamental metrics that we can all agree are required in the call center. But taking time to help employees understand why a low ox time matters, because that's profitability for the company that leads to financial incentives for all employees and coverage for customers, because if we can answer their calls uh, at the right time, it's gonna be a better experience for the customer, which results in a better experience for the employee um, because I've taken the calls and then a customer that waits uh, about 40 to 70 seconds for me is far better to work with than the customer who's waited seven to 10 minutes to talk with me. Um, and then the first minute is just letting them vent. Uh, so th those are some of the things that we do to, to connect to performance is bringing the employees into the decision-making process. They know what needs to be done, and by giving them a voice, it, gives, it builds credibility to what's expected. And, and then the, the next step is leaders must be consistent, and we all slip on this from time to time. It's not about treating everybody the same. It's about being consistent in how we treat people overall. So if we're going to change the quality standards, we need to give people a heads up and let them know that it's changing and talk a little bit about why it's changing. And then be graceful in those initial feedback sessions, helping them make that tr transition, but then holding everybody to the same standard. Not necessarily treating everybody exactly the same, but holding everybody to the same standard. When leaders are predictable, meaning that when employees know what the leaders expect of them and can count on the leaders to recognize certain behaviors and um, provide developmental feedback or some would say correct undesirable behaviors, that actually helps us as employees, self-included, know how I can win at work. There are very few people who show up at work thinking, how can I screw up today? Just about everybody walks in the door thinking, I'm going to make today a great day. Our role as leadership at the strategic level and at the management level front line is helping people understand what's expected, not in a rigorous dictatorial way, but in a collaborative, supportive way, 
makes the difference for employees because they feel like they can win. That's how I feel when I come to work. That's how the people around me feel. And it doesn't matter whether it's your first time taking a call as an agent or you're the CEO sitting in the corner office. We want to know what success looks like when we start so we can work towards that. It's our responsibility as leaders to make that path clear and then be consistent in our messaging. Now, you talked about really starting to tailor some of the st- – think about employees in a different way. You know, obviously hold them to the same standard, but not necessarily treat them exactly the same way in every circumstance. You also talked about the importance of employees having a seat at the table, listening to their voice. One of the areas where these concepts tend to kind of intersect concerns training. Training, you know, obviously you want to be able to, where possible, deliver proactive, personalized, agile coaching – that's really based on what the cu- what the agent really needs. What are they looking for? What are they requesting? What are their specific strengths and weaknesses? And that sounds great. And obviously, if I were to ask you, should you personalize coaching, you're probably going to say yes. But a lot of organizations may not see this as practical. They don't know that they have enough trainers to really develop kind of unique curricula for every individual agent. They may not feel as if they can go afford to go beyond the basic sort of group training. And so what do you say to them? How do you sort of make sure that you're preparing and coaching and developing agents in a personalized and flexible way while still being mindful of those basic cost limitations. I'm really glad that you asked about this because my my thoughts on this have evolved over the last 10 years. Um, I was really looking for ways to create super customized learning. Uh, and, And as we continue to expand internationally, what I found is similar to what I was talking before about helping people, uh, being consistent and helping people know what to expect. It's also what I've learned in training. While individuals need different coaching, and I'll come back to that in just a minute, um, from a training perspective, we need to be really clear about what our expectations are and what success looks like. And so what I've learned um, specifically in the last five years about training curriculum design uh, and the development of content for our agents is it's really critical to have a central hub where our policies and processes are established and and ensure that as we roll that out across uh, geographies, that those policies and processes are consistently delivered um, to every locale so that the customer experience is the same no matter where they're contacting from uh, and whom they're talking with. So consistency actually matters in that. You mentioned coaching being different, though, and, and that really is the difference. So once we've built that standard training that everybody knows what the expectations are and what success looks like so it's consistent across the board, then that customized training comes in, and that's where we handle it differently. The role of the manager, and frankly, it's not just in the contact center. It's across the organization. Again, the role of the manager is to provide that custom coaching uh, to help the employee get from where they are closer to the standard while being true to who they are as an individual so that the experience of the customer contact comes through as authentic authentic with the it, with the agent however consistent with the experience for all customers so that when our customers are talking with our employees they're getting the same message they're getting the same support even though you're getting authentic personality from each individual that's different and in order to do that the only way you can be successful is when the managers and the frontline leadership and supervisors are providing that custom coaching, helping employees get from where they are closer to the standard while remaining true to their authentic personality. Tremendous insight there, Corey. I think you really covered what an organization needs to be thinking about at all levels of the contact center, what needs to be top of mind for leaders. And insofar as at CCW University, you're really going to be advising the future leaders, the future movers and shakers within our space. Your, these insights are exactly what they need to hear, and I know exactly what they're going to value as they embark on their own journeys within their customer contact functions. Now, before we wrap up today, you know, we've talked business. We've talked about your topic and your work. I want to get to know you a little bit because we're talking about an event. We're heading to Nashville, and the people are going to want to network. They're going to, going to want to get to know the speakers and the, the people behind all these great ideas. And so – I think it's good to ask a few questions to get to know you. So first of all, have you been to Nashville at all? 
I have not been to Nashville, though I feel like I've been to Nashville because for two years, Team Beachbody brought hundreds of thousands of coaches, uh, independent coaches, to the city to help them build their business. So I feel really connected to Nashville, and when I learned we would be in Nashville, I was really excited because I have that connection with our Team Beachbody coaches there. I'm excited as well. I personally haven't been there either, but, you know, I have traveled to other places, and I have some favorite cities, some not-so-favorite cities. What's your favorite place to vacation? You know, I really like staying home here in California because the, the question is, when you live in paradise, where do you vacation? Mm -hmm. So I'll tell you, one year we saved up and we took a trip to uh, the big island of Hawaii, and we took a night dive with the manta rays, and that is probably the single most majestic experience of my life. Um, being in the water with these massive manta rays, just unbelievable. And you watch the videos and you think that can't be real. And so having done that, I, I've got to tell you, if I could go back and, and take that dream vacation again, I would do that. I kind of want to sign up as well. I'll see if, you know, like if any bonuses are in store for me where I can make that trip happen. That sounds amazing. Now, you know, speaking of things, you know, getting to know you a little bit, you know, what would you say is your biggest guilty pleasure? Ice cream. And as a guy that works at Beachbody, that's saying something. But <laughs> I love my vanilla ice cream. Yeah, it, it definitely makes sense. Certainly, you know, it would be a guilty pleasure within the confines of your organization. But I got to tell you, of all the speakers we've been profiling ahead of Nashville, basically every single one has either said some sort of alcoholic beverage or some sort of food. So you're definitely not alone with this crowd coming to Nashville with us. Good well, news. Yeah, definitely. And so one of the areas, too, you know, what is, you know, you've obviously had the chance to work with some great people. You've, you've admired some organizations. Do you have any business role models, whether that's a specific person or a company that you really admire? Yeah, the, the list is long. The, the one person that's been a guide for me over the years is Jim Rohn. Uh, he, he really set the tone about helping people get what they want, um, you know, Making yourself available to support others uh, really was transformational for me, and it shaped the way I lead and the way I think about leadership. I'm just a servant here to support people, and, and that's why when I looked at Beachbody as a career option and I read the mission about helping people achieve their goals, I, it just aligned. It, it's people like Jim Rohn, Zig Ziglar, those that have gone before that have really set the tone that it, it's about leadership. You think about Peter Drucker, and, and if you haven't read any Peter Drucker, it's old stuff, but it's really good, and it, it, it's about businesses serving a purpose for society and not just about making money. And as I talk with different organizations, um, money always seems to be at the front, at the forefront, but the money comes after the service you provide society. So it, it's leaders and thinkers like that. And, and then most recently, since I'll be talking about your career path, I'll say Sheryl Sandberg, who talked about the career jungle gym, really created a paradigm shift for me in the way I think about careers and helping people advance their careers. Lateral moves are actually more important than those up ladder, uh, those up ladder opportunities. So those are a few people that just off the cuff are inspirational and really uh, people that I admire. Certainly some great names there and even better advice that you were able to share from them. But now as we wrap up, I have a question. What is your biggest piece of advice for people who are probably trying to embark on journeys similar to the one that you did, you know, really starting in maybe a, a lower managerial role within the contact center on the ground floor, and then moving up to the point where you're, you're designing strategy, you're developing organizations, and most importantly, perhaps you're speaking at CCW Nashville. Yeah, it, it's a couple things, and, and I'll keep it simple. Uh, the first and most important is proactively manage your own career. Know where you're going. You know, Stephen Covey, uh, another great thinker, said, begin with the end in mind. And you read the seven habits, that's where it starts. So if you don't 
know where you're going, sit down and decide where you want to end up and proactively manage your career and make sure influential people in your circles, um, particularly within leadership, know what you're looking for. And it shouldn't just be the next job. And it shouldn't be about a salary increase. It's got to be what is your contribution to the organization and to society. And, and when it's about that, you can proactively manage your career. Consi and, and the next thing, consistently choose the right skills to develop next. So you know what you're good at and you know what you're not good at. So Marcus Buckingham talked about always focus on your strengths, don't spend a lot of time on your weaknesses. There's a lot of truth in that. Um, so what's the next skill that you're going to develop? It's not necessarily the thing I'm good at, I'm going to be great at. And it's definitely not the thing I'm really bad at, I'm going to get mediocre at. It's the next thing you need in that career progression based on what you said is important. Develop that skill. Every Two years, you should have something that you're, excuse me, twice a year, you should have something that's kind of, I'm going to add this to my resume because I'm becoming an expert in it. Uh, the, the third thing is learn to manage your manager. People get tripped up here all the time because they get caught up in the personality conflict or differences between you and your manager. So manage your manager. Learn how to manage your manager and provide them support so that you're filling the gaps in their leadership or in their strength so that they can be more successful in their role. I have found consistently when you help your manager win, you also win. Next is build strategic relationships. So look across the organization and find a way to have a cohort of supporters for you, not just within your tr your chain of command, but across the organization. So if you're a front frontline agent just starting out in your career and you want to advance, then that circle is going to be rather small. It's your responsibility to know somebody in workforce and to know somebody in HR and to know somebody in technology. And by building those relationships, your name will start to come up when opportunities are available. And then the, the last thing that I'll share about tips align what you want with what the company needs. Those five things will help you more than anything else advance your career, whether it's your first day as a call center agent or your first day as a senior vice president. Well, it may seem impossible to believe, but this is only a small taste of the amazing amount of insights that we're going to get from Corey as he leads his CCW University session in Nashville this January. Honestly, can't wait for that. And if you're listening here, whether you're a seasoned executive who is just looking to pick up some tips and best practices, or whether you are a, an up-and-coming manager looking to rise through the ranks, clearly this is a guy you want to be learning from. Clearly this is a story that you want to be introducing yourself to as you embark on your own journey. So definitely join us in Nashville. And Corey, thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, thank you, and I'm looking forward to seeing everybody in Nashville. And definitely, and for CCW Digital, this has been Brian Cantor.